what we'll be talking about today is CRISPR-Cas, um, which is quite a new tool in uh, molecular biology, but one that made a huge difference in the field. Um, so basically the first use of it is, is uh, barely a bit more than 10 years ago. Um, but today it's it's a standard um, method in, in basically every uh, life science lab that you'll need uh, because it, it made a lot of things a lot easier. So um, what is CRISPR-Cas? CRISPR-Cas generally is a method to cut DNA. So the the molecule uh, molecule of uh, on which uh, all the information about how our body how our cells are built is stored that's not something completely new we had a lot of tools to cut dna before especially restriction enzymes like um, they were discovered in the late 60s 70s and um, already were the start of molecular biology as such, like uh, for molecular cloning and cutting and pasting DNA. Um, but what CRISPR-Cas does, what other restriction enzymes that cut DNA don't do, is um, it can cut at almost any point. Most restriction enzymes are specific for four to eight um, different bases that, that are in specific positions and then they can do a cut there. But if I want to cut DNA somewhere else, then I need another tool. And, and CRISPR was basically the first tool that was almost freely programmable to cut in any position. And that also brings about the second big point that changed. We can use it in, in vitro which means in a living cell, in a living organism. And that's what, what makes it a huge step for medicine, molecular medicine, um, for gene therapies. That That is basically what enabled the first gene therapies that will now come on the market maybe this year already. So what does it stand for? CRISPR, the shorthand CRISPR means clustered regularly in spaced short palindromic repeats. That's quite a long word, so CRISPR is a bit more handy. Um, those uh, palindromic repeats are special places in the DNA of bacteria that have been basically seen and described again and again under different names since 1987. So it's it's not completely new. That's something we've seen quite early in different area. And what is so special about it, it's, it's short strips of DNA that repeat each, uh, themselves from both sides. So they, they are palindromic, like uh, um, if you read them from one side, they are the same as if you read them from the other side. Um, they are repeated. So those um, um, those spa uh, those DNA, this DNA comes again and again with short spaces in between where there's different genetic material in between. So those are called spacers. We'll come back on that later on. Um, so basically, this, these these repeats, these CRISPR were discovered already. Uh, 1987, but nobody knew what they were um, for. And then in the early 2000s, there were the first scientists that um, got the idea that there is something special about that. And it seems to have something to do with cutting DNA and with uh, the immune system of bacteria. Um, so they discovered that the there are those CAS proteins, which uh, is a shorthand for CRISPR associated, um, and that they do something with those CRISPR repeats that um, cut them off at, at uh, certain points. So that, that was discovered in the early 2000s. And then the big step was in 2012, when uh, a research group led by um, uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Dudner, um, in California, in Berkeley, um, they 
discovered how to program the system and how to change where CRISPR makes the cut and how to feed it a sequence that you want to cut. And that was, was the re revolutionary thing because they made this natural occurring um, immune system of bacteria into a tool for molecular uh, biology. Um, there actually, you can see that the time was kind of ripe for the discovery but because almost in parallel, it's a bit disputed if, if he wasn't actually a bit earlier, there were works by uh, Viginius Shishnish uh, from, from the Vilnius, Vilnius University. Um, he kind of discovered the same thing. He didn't describe it as well as, um, as Charpentier and Dudner, but um, it, it was about the same time. And a little later, uh, based basically on the works of, of Charpentier and, and Dudner, um, uh, quite a famous scientist, Feng Zhang from the Broad Institute. Um, he described it for the first times in eukaryotic cells, so not bacteria, but uh, plants, fungi, and uh, animals like ourselves. Um, in those cells, he described a system based on CRISPR-Cas to, to cut DNA at specific uh, places. And um, up to today, there's still a patent um, um, discussion about who has got the rights to CRISPR-Cas. And currently, it looks like Feng Zhang will, will win this and will get the rights for CRISPR-Cas, while uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Dudner in 2020 at least finally got a Nobel Prize in chemistry for their discovery. So how does this work? Um, how does it work in nature first? So I, I told you it's a part of an immune system in bacteria. So what are bacteria worried about? Obviously not really bacteria. So what they get infected by is, is virus. And viruses in bacteria are called phages and they are a huge threat for bacteria. Um, a huge part of, of bacterial populations get infected and killed by viruses. So they invest a lot of energy to avoid this. And um, how do they avoid this? Because a virus doesn't really live. It only lives if, if it has some living cell to infect, which reproduces it for it. Um, so it's about stopping it injecting its building plan, its DNA into um, a living cell. And it does that, so the bacteria does, uh, does that by first identifying viral DNA, which is injected into the cells. And in the first round, it can't really do a lot of uh, about it, but there are uh, proteins there, past proteins that identify this DNA and copy places from it. So there, if there is a certain place that, that those proteins recognize, which is the PAM, we'll come later back to what that is, then they look at the 20 or something um, nucleotides, so base pairs of which DNA is made, which come after that, cut that out and store it in the genome of um, the bacterium. First, we, uh, in, in the uh, 1980s, 90s, when this was discovered, nobody knew why this happens, but today we know what happens then. Uh, what happens then is if the same or very similar virus infects the bacterium again, then those um, spacers, which contain the, the DNA of the virus, are later on red, so they are transferred to RNA, which is the normal way to pr also produce proteins out of that. But then this RNA is cut down into small pieces and it works with another calf protein, another CRISPR associated protein together to recognize the viral DNA and cut it. And by that, stop the viral reproduction cycle. So it can avoid the, the virus to take over the bacterial cell. 
So today we know that, that this is a very widespread system in bacteria as well as archaea, which is something a bit similar to bacteria, but even older. So almost half of the bacteria that we know of today have some kind of, um, uh, of a CRISPR-Cas system. And uh, in archaea, it's even 83. So it's it's... A lot of bacteria have this system to avoid viral threats. Um, and they all work somehow in the same way, but they are very, very different. So there's a wide variety of those CRISPR systems, which is still to be discovered. So re uh, scientists all over the world look at all those thousands and and thousands of different CRISPR systems currently and look at what they, they are doing differently. And in some cases, that even means um, the, the, the CRISPR system in the bacterium can be relevant for its uh, pathogenity. So if, if you knock out the CRISPR system, it's not only that this bacterium can't defend against virus anymore, but it in some cases it also means that it can't infect humans anymore. So there's still a lot to learn about the basics, why bacteria have this, how it works, what different kinds of systems there are. But um, today we kind of know how they use it at least. So I told you it's a system to cut DNA at a certain place. How this works, we'll look at that later, but why do we want to do that? And the interesting thing about cutting DNA is that a cell will always try to repair that. DNA double strand breaks and that's what happens. So both DNA strands are cut at a certain point, which we call then a double strand break. That happens in our cells all of the time, basically. That can happen through UV light. So if you are in the sun and you get, then you get DNA damaged all the time. Normally cells can repair that. Mm -hmm. And the same goes if you make such a uh, cut with CRISPR. And there's different ways to repair that for a cell. One, basically the easiest way to do that, but also a bit of a dangerous way for the cell is to recur, uh, repair that with non-homologous end joining, which means it just takes those blunt ends and sticks them together somehow without looking at if, if something is missing or if something integrated itself. Um, and that normally, basically in two of, of, of three cases, leads to a complete um, deletion if that happens within a gene that is normally responsible to produce um, some protein. Because if you it, it normally happens that you lose a few base pairs in between. And now the thing with the genetic code is it's always in triplets. So um, always th three bases in the DNA code for one amino acid in a protein. And if you cut out only one or two of those bases, then you destroy all the code that comes afterwards because the reading frame of, of the gene is destroyed. So non-homologous end joining is something that for the cell is quite problematic that but which can be used with a crispr cut to delete a gene to to destroy a gene uh, because in two or three cases everything that comes behind the the position where you made the cut will be nonsense because you you ruined the reading frame and and the rest of the gene can't be read normally so that's quite practical if you just want to destroy something. If if there are is some gene product, for example, from from uh, a mutated gene that is toxic in in medicine, then this is normally already enough. If you can knock this out, like destroy the gene product, it can already help. If if uh, you have some problem with a toxic gene product, um, what? can also happen, and what happens a bit more often, is some kind of middle way where um, you use micro homology uh, and, and, uh, for end joining, which kind of at least looks at the ends of the DNA, if whether they fit. 
Um, that's, that's a bit of a special case, so I won't go into that too much because what is mostly used in um, molecular biology and today also more and more used in gene ther therapies is the third way of repairing a double strand break, which is homology directed repair. So the best way for a cell to repair a DNA double strand break is with DNA that spans that break. And the trick, why, why is there DNA that stands, uh, spans that break normally is in all our cells, we don't have only one copy of our DNA, we have two. It's not identical because one of those copies we get from our, our father, the other copy we get from our mother. But still, since all of us, all of us humans are very, very similar in our DNA, our father and mother normally are close enough that if you want to repair a special place in a gene, it's good to look at this other chromosome, which has a copy of this gene. And that's what, what happens in homology directed repair. So the repair machinery looks for a strand of DNA that matches the ends directly before the break. And then it just copies over what it finds in between and fills the gap. That's a very good way of repairing. And it's also a great me mechanism that you can misuse kind of for molecular biology. Because if you do not only uh, inflict a break, but also feed at the same time, feed the cell with a specific repair DNA that on both sides looks like it would fill the gap, but in between has some more information that you would want to put in, like a repair gene or some, some new gene you want to put in, then the cell will just integrate it because it thinks that's, that's what's missing there. And that's, that's the way how you can really uh, put new genetic material, new information into the genome of an organism. And that's a really interesting uh, thing if you want to have really cool uh, gene therapies and, and stuff like that, and also for research. So what I told you before is about the PEM. The, um, <clears throat> the PEM is a short se a sequence, um, which is called proto-spacer adjacent motif. So the motif directly before this spacer, um, the, the, which is the DNA, which is kind of the programmed part where I can say where I want CRISPR-Cas to cut. Um, and the PAM is normally a very short sequence and a very unspecific sequence of bases for the most and the best known uh, Cas protein that you normally use in, in um, molecular biology, which is the Streptococcus pyrog uh, pyogenes. Um, SPCAS9. This is just three letters, NGG. And actually the N is just any, any letter. So that's basically a sequence that you get thousands and millions of times everywhere in the genome. So you, you will find this sequence in every gene you look at at least 20 times. So you, you can cut anywhere after this sequence. And how the sequence looks exactly depends on which Cas protein you use. So there, there's a wide variety, uh, variety that we knew today, uh, that we know today, that we can use to cut DNA specifically at those places. So we need this PEM sequence where the uh, Cas protein binds first, and then it unfolds the double-stranded DNA into single strands, and then it checks whether the spacer fits. So whether the, 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 the short RNA sequence, which I gave uh, into the Cas protein, uh, fits the position. And only if this fits, it cuts at this position, both strands. And then the DNA is cut. And then what uh, I explained on the last slide will happen. It will repair this either. Uh, by with the method where it loses uh, loses uh, loses some kinds uh, some some letters and probably destroys the gene, or it it just uses it uses some template it has to repair it. 
So, what do we need for CRISPR-Cas? We basically, to only make a cut, need two things. We need a guide RNA, which decides which place is to be cut, which normally has something like 20 bases to target, to make a really uh, perfectly targeted cut. And we need the protein that makes the cut. So for example, Cas9, a CRISPR-associated protein. Um, those form an RNA, uh, RNA uh, protein complex, and then they can cut DNA. And if I don't, uh, if, if my target is not only to destroy a gene, but to put something new in, then I also need donor DNA or repair DNA, which I have to feed the cell, which then is the template for repairing and which I can use to bring something new into the genome. There are different ways to get this into the cells. So for, for this short piece of RNA, we can just deliver it directly as RNA. The cell will normally take some of it up, um, but we can also use viral vectors. So we can change um, the genome of a virus so that it contains what, what we want to feed the cell. Um, or we can use some nanoparticles, uh, DNA nanostructures, cell penetrating peptides or electri um, uh, electric energy. If I um, use an electric field, I can um, that, that will help um, get DNA into a cell. Or there are also other physical me um, methods like microinjection or mechanical cell deformation. So all of this has to go into a cell to then make the cut and to then repair and maybe knock something in or out of the uh, genome. So what are, are the pros and cons of this method? Um, as I told you, the pros are quite big because it, it uh, today is a real standard uh, method and basically all, all of the gene thera therapies that come to the market in the next years are based on CRISPR-Cas because you can hit almost any target. It's very easily programmable and has a very high efficiency. So it normally really cuts. If you get it delivered, it also cuts. It will make the cut as often as it can because it only stops cutting if the sequence that, that, it, uh, look, that it is looking for is removed from the genome with my repair DNA or by loss of enough basis so it is not recognized anymore. So um, the efficiency is good and I can use it in vitro in a living cell. The workflows are very fast. So from the design of, um, of um, a guide RNA to really having a modified cell takes weeks at most. So it's, it's, it's really quick. Um, and it's it's quite inexpensive to be uh, because to design this RNA basically costs you nothing. It's it's um, something if you if you order um, those those sequences that you need for the guide RNA, you order them as DNA normally. Um, it will cost you something like five euros or something like that. So it's it's um, quite inexpensive if you if in the first step you have all the other material you, you need for that. And um, it's a very interesting system because it is also the basis of many other new methods. I will go a bit more deeply into this uh, in the next in one of the next slides. Um, but there are also points that speak against CRISPR-Cas, uh, which also makes it, um, which also brought up a few other methods that that kind of do the same the same thing but differently. The biggest thing and the biggest problem, especially for medical use, is that you have off-target cuts. So you have cuts in positions uh, in the genome where you don't want cuts. And uh, depending on the study that you read, it can be up to 50% of, of the cuts uh, in the wrong position. And that's always bad because every cut in DNA means there's some risk of uh, genomic instability and cancer in the end. And that's what you don't want to have if you have a medical treatment. Um, another um, disadvantage is that you have to put in 
several different uh, materials. So I told you we need the guide RNA, we need the Cas protein itself, and we need the repair DNA to really direct what we put in there. Um, that's three parts, and especially the Cas protein is quite big. So if you think about how you get the DNA into the cells, there you already get uh, with, with sometimes get a problem with, for example, viral vectors because they don't take up so much genetic material in one run. So sometimes you need more than one virus and that makes it very inefficient to deliver a, a gene ther therapy. Um, if you want to build a CRISPR experiment, it's still necessary to do a, a classical cloning to build a vector to uh, get this into the cell. So it's still, it is easy compared to the methods we had before, but it doesn't really mean that it's easy. So it's it's easy for me molecular biologists. I will give you an, an example how the workflow looks later on. Um, it, it is uh, quite a bit of work still. And um, especially in animal cells and also in human cells, it's not so easy to make sure that um, only, for example, homology directed repair is used by the cell. So if you want to put in your own information, that doesn't always work because sometimes the break you inflict will also be just repaired by non-homologous end joining, which then doesn't get your information in, but still destroys this part of DNA, which you probably don't want to destroy. So that's also kind of um, a risk for off-target effects that you don't want. There are alternatives. I won't go into that too deeply. Um, the biggest alternatives which um, make kind of do the same thing are talons and thing, uh, zinc finger nucleases. The big thing of, about both of them is it's a lot harder to program them. So normally you you don't really do that yourself because it, it's very complicated to do that. So you will normally order that from a company and then it costs you a lot of money compared to CRISPR. Um, but what is nice about them, you always need two to cut DNA because each of them only cuts one strand. And that seems like it makes it more complicated, but it also makes, makes it more on target. Off-target effects are not very likely if you need two fitting position, uh, two proteins that, that are in position to make a double strand. So that makes it very target specific and could make it safer in, if you use it in, in medical um, uh, development. But also CRISPR keeps on developing and there are uh, a few different things that, that have been done already that make it um, work easier, that make it work better, and that make it more, um, uh, that, that make it have less of target effects, um, which is today we have a tighter control of the production of the Cas9 protein and of the SG RNA in cells. So if, if you make this more specific to a certain position in the cell cycle, for example, it's easier to force it to only use one repair method over the other. Um, then we today also know a lot of different Cas variants uh, from, from other organisms that have other PAM sequences. So it, it even makes um, the use of them wider. If you can't fight to find the fitting target in the gene, you can use a different Cas protein and then you will probably find it. And some of them also cut differently. So they sometimes produce staggered ends. Um, some of them have a higher specificity, uh, specificity than, than what we have with Cas9, for example. And um, also, the, the Cas proteins have been mutated and, and uh, changed a lot today. Uh, for example, um, what has been developed are NIC cases that um, don't make a double strand cut, but only cut one strand. And then you can have the same advantages like uh, for talons and, and zinc finger nucleases, uh, because you can also design two Cas proteins that only cut the strand if both fit which makes uh, off-target effects a lot uh, less. Um, then uh, 
there are fusion uh, proteins of different kinds, by which include um, um, domains of, of CRISPR-Cas. I won't go in there too deeply, but I think a big thing that will be uh, now developed in the next year are prime editors, which include a lot more functions and make it a lot easier to, to really insert your gene genetic material at exactly the right position and only at the right position. And um, which which makes it a lot safer to use this in medic in the medical field, and there are a lot of different versions like um, CRISPR versions that, that can switch uh, epigenetic uh, switches on and off on genes, or that can just label genes uh, with fluorescent or bioluminescent proteins. So let's get to the medical part. What do we want to use it for? Um, Obviously, it, we want to change the genome of the patient um, and repair something that is broken in the genome. In the easiest part, we just want to knock out, so destroy some defective genes that produce something which accumulates and, and uh, makes the patient ill. But um, more often we have um, the, the more complicated case where we want to repair something or add something. So insert a correct gene or an additional gene that isn't there yet, um, or repair a gene genetic defect. And there are three versions of doing that, three kinds of, of gene therapy that are very different and that are less uh, more and more ethically in debate. Um, the thing that already kind of happens today and will come to the big market already later this year is um, modification of immune cells or, or other cells ex vivo. So you take cells from a patient, then you modify their genes and then you expand them, make them uh, make a lot of them um, in, in a bottle and then reinfuse them into the patient. The first things that come to market now this year here is, um, uh, is a cure for a special kind of anemia, the sickle cell anemia, which you are born with and, and which makes uh, breathing quite hard and, and makes your oxygen levels too low. And that um, is basically repaired by harvesting hematopoietic cells, stem cells, putting in a, a working copy of the gene and re injecting them in the patient and then they will uh, will build red blood cells that work and that are not sickle cells anymore. Another thing that, that works in this way are CAR T cells um, which destroy cancer cells and also work against autoimmune uh, um, uh, things that, that you can have like lupus or other um, <clears throat> things that are uh, not treatable today. Um, the, next, the, the, the next thing is modification of cells in vivo, which is a bit more complicated because you have to get the genes into the body somehow. That's very hard because delivering um, a gene in anywhere in the body is basically impossible today because we don't have the shuttles that use that. The only things that are reachable in the body from without are basically our eyes and our bone marrow a bit and our liver because our liver basically takes up everything that you inject into the bloodstream and then so it's quite easy to modify cells in the liver um, and the ethically most debatable and uh, thing so it won't happen in the next 10 years probably it already happened once in china but um that, that got a lot of, a lot of backslash is a modification of germline cells. So basically change the DNA of children before they are made. Um, that's, that's quite an interesting thing to do because it is quite feasible. It's, it's easy to reach this one cell, change some, some genes and maybe cure some, some, um, uh, some genetic problem of the parents before the kids even get that but um, changing the genome of, of unborn children is still very hotly debated if that's really something we should do. Um, 
there are still a lot of problems in, in using gene therapies. It's, um, you have, it has to be targeted, it has to be efficient, it shouldn't have side effects. So the shuttles are very uh, hard to get by that have sufficient capacity and, and no off-target effects. And there are also obviously the ethical concern, concerns. So there are currently a lot of, of studies, a few thousand studies for gene therapies um, in, in phase two or phase three of clinical development. Most of them are against anemias where uh, you use hematopoietic stem cells. Um, there are also some uh, against HIV, which um, are targeted to make people immune to HIV by changing their white blood cells. Um, and the biggest, uh, the biggest business, obviously, for pharma industry currently, currently is cancer and autoimmune disease with things like uh, tumor in infiltrating lycosides or CAR T cells. If you want to change something directly, as I said, eye and liver are things that are in development, so somatic gene therapies. Um, and there are a few things in development for type 1 diabetes by modifying liver cells. So a bit more about CAR T cells before I finish. Um, what are CAR T cells? So you take blood from a patient and harvest T cells, immune cells from the patient himself. And then you insert a gene for a CAR, which is a chimeric antigen receptor, which kind of helps the T cell later on detect something it can't detect now, especially um, other T cells that, that work against the own body or uh, cancer cells. And then you expand them, you grow them in the lab till you have millions of them, and then you re-inject them in the same patients. So we won't have any problem with the immune system of the patient uh, deflecting this or, or putting the cells out because it's his own cells. The body recognizes its own cells. And then those CAR T cells can attack cancer cells and kill them. So that will definitely be a big step towards curing a lot, a lot of cancers that are not really well curable today. Um, I've got a link to a short video, um, but I'm already a bit over time. So I'll probably copy that into the comments and uh, you can uh, look at that later on. So I'll just give you a short overview of what easy means in that case. This is the CRISPR-Cas system I'm using in the lab on yeast, so not, not in human cells on yeast, which is a lot easier actually. And still, it's a lot of steps you have to do to develop a CRISPR um, experiment to knock some gene out, out to change, change some gene. So you have to build a vector to get this in, a second vector to get the, the Cas protein in. You need the repair DNA, which you have to build with several PCR steps. And then you have to get this in the, into the cells. And then you still have to select the cells that took this up and where it worked. So in the end, all of this is still a matter of a few weeks for me as somebody who studied this for years and, and who's been establishing that for about a year in the lab before it really worked. So CRISPR is easy, but it's, it's far off something that anybody could do in their own kitchen. So thank you very much. I will give you the link for a short video explaining the technology again later on in the comments. But for now, I'll probably better get some questions from you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Felix Richard, for this brilliant uh, presentation on the CRISPR-Cas technique. I believe uh, we here are also happy to discover that uh, a lot has been done in view of diseases such as HIV, sickle cell, and uh, much more. And uh, yes, uh, you, are, you have a question, you can turn on your microphone and uh, please, uh, we should take this um, as an opportunity to really um, learn, opportunity to ask questions to someone who actually practice this uh, technique. So if you have a question, I will uh, appreciate uh, you, you, you ask. Thank you. I will ask the first question. My first question is, uh, Mr. Felix Richard, uh, how do we, or what does it take 
for a, a, a scientist to 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 um, perform this in in the clinic in his research lab or something like that. Yeah. Um, so in the clinic, it takes a lot. Uh, that's that's not something that as a scientist you can really do because there are uh, huge hurdles to get something into patients, which is fair because it has risks, obviously. I told you about the cancer risks and the off-target effects. So you first really have to prove that something is absolutely safe because you can get even get into um, a clinical study on patients. And then you have to prove that it works and then uh, only you can get it to the market. So that's a very long way, actually. That's, that's why we just now, basically this year, see the first CRISPR-Cas gene therapies get onto the market because it took about 10 years from development to, to the clinic. So that's that's a very long way to get this into a, a scientific lab to to establish a CRISPR-Cas method in in a molecular biology lab. You don't need a lot. So what you need is you need either you can design your own system, but that takes a long time and it's very complicated. But basically, if you've got some species you want to work on, like um, or, or human cell lines or uh, plants, then you just look up who is using a CRISPR system that, that could work for the species and, and that is well described and that you can change easily. Um, and then the easiest way is, is uh, you can just order that mat material. So what, what you normally need now is plasmids that have the code on them that you need for this. Um, so a CRISPR plasmid, and there are hundreds of, uh, of, of them, um, for research purposes, is very easy to get. Because if you are a molecular biology lab, you can order in, in repositories of this DNA, which um, the most, uh, uh, there, there is one big um, nonprofit company in, in the US um, that, uh, that spreads this DNA, but there are a few small uh, uh, different ones. If you read um, a scientific publication, they will normally always say, we uh, deposited this DNA in this and this repository and you can order it here. If they didn't write that, in every scientific report, there's always an email address of the corresponding author. You can just write to them and they will definitely send you the, this, uh, this DNA because um, research is, is and should be free. So everything that is not developed by a company, but by a university or research institute, you will get the code for that. And uh, then you can use that. Normally, what you, what you need is the standard things you, you have in a molecular biology lab. So you will need pipettes and a sterile workplace and uh, centrifuges, uh, tubes and, and everything you need for normal molecular biology. Um, and what you need to do with this vector you get from, from one of those repositories is you clone in the, the sequence that you want to have as a target which um, normally is something like 20 base pairs, which define where the cut will be made. And you normally uh, insert this um, as a short oligo. And those short oligos, you can order them uh, for a few dollars uh, a piece. So there, there are a lot of companies that print DNA for you. And as long as it's that short, like less than 30 base pairs, it will only cost you a few dollars. Um, and if you have that, you perform this cloning procedure, then, then you have to get your DNA into the cells, which again, how you do it depends on which organism you are working with. But uh, there are normally standard procedures to do that, that you can look up. And at that point, you only need to have some, some selective um, part in the DNA that you inserted to make sure that you can identify the cells where your modification worked. And then normally you have to check whether that really worked in the genome. And there you normally use um, a colony PCR, which is also again, a standard method in, in a molecular biology lab.
Thank you, sir. That was uh, very detailed. And why we expect the other questions, sir, I read your articles and I was very triggered by uh, your research on the aging, uh, the fountain of youth. Can you mm -hmm. briefly tell us uh, what, uh, what, what motivates you and uh, your aspirations with regards to this research? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting topic. I mean, um, about 20 years ago, um, everybody thought it was ridiculous to, to work on, on changing something about aging because everybody thought aging is just nature. Well, it happens. Uh, today, we kind of know that that's not true. It's not, there are even animals that don't age in the same way that we do. Um, and as, there are even some anim animals which are in theory at least uh, immortal so they can rejuvenate themselves so it would be very nice to to get this into humans as well uh, immortality is, is a far off goal but but to have people age slower is a very interesting thing well you know people get older and older in most of the world and um, that brings about a lot of new problems a lot of new uh, things that that make people ill after they are 65, 70, something like that. They get a lot of things that we all have to take care of. So, um, which are cost us a lot of money, which make people unhappy, which make people ill and uh, make people that can't work anymore and that can't enjoy life anymore. So if we can change this, I mean, living longer would also be nice, but but being ill less a smaller part of the end of our life, that, that would be a great thing if we could change that with, um, with some wonder pill or something. So that's why, why this fascinates me. And um, so what I'm working about uh, on currently is, is a system to find new uh, molecules that could maybe influence aging or maybe even cancer, because I'm working on telomeres, which are the, the kind of the end caps of our chromosomes. And the thing about them is the older we get, the shorter they get. And at a certain point, when they get too short, our cells don't work anymore, really. So that's kind of one of the reasons we, we age and we get old suddenly. Um, so if we could find some some uh, molecule that helps them stay longer or even make make them longer again that would be interesting about aging but if you find something that shortens them that's also interesting because cancer cells normally have very very short telomeres and if we can even shorten them a bit we would probably push them over the brink and kill them so that that uh, it it has two very interesting uh, um, things if if we find some molecules that influence telomere length. So that I'm trying to build a system that allows it on on a high throughput level, like screening ten thousands of different molecules within a few days, um, to find molecules that that change something about telomere length. Thank you, sir. That that is uh, fascinating, and uh, it, it it feels like it's from a movie, but uh, it's <laughs> actual science. So my last question, if um, you can pen down your questions in the chat session, if you um, can't uh, put on your mic. So my last question will be in view of our uh, of the developing economy of Africa. How do you think, uh, Chris? per case can help um, in the, the health sector, in the agricultural sector and uh, engineering as a whole. How do you think um, it can help um, these economies? Oh, there are a lot of ways where how it could help. So the, the huge thing about it is it's a very new method. So um, there's not a lot of, uh, a, a lot to, keep up you know it's new for everyone so if you start now you basically after probably a year or, or maybe two or three you probably know as much about it as the top scientists of the world because nobody knows so much about it yet and as i said it's very it's um it's a method that allows very cheap and easy and quick development of genetic variations and it's not only, I mean, the medical field obviously is interesting, but the medical field 
probably in Africa as well as everywhere else is is um, is so hard to get into because there's so m much money and so many regulations in there that basically only the really big corporations can get into that. And that's probably a handful all over the world, maybe 10 that um, that develop most of, of the pharmaceutical product products today. So if you develop something new there as a small company, the best thing that can normally happen to you is to be bought by big pharma as soon as you prove that that what you are developing works. That, but that makes you rich, that doesn't really change the economy. What does change the economy and could change the economy is, is more genetic uh, development in other fields like food production. You can modify plants very easily and very quickly and increase the crop uh, the, the crop turnover or make crop more drought resistant and that especially with the climate change coming up is a huge business so if you can develop a rice plant that only needs half the water it's it's a huge thing if you can build um, a pumpkin that gets twice as big and um, or um, uh, a crop that has more vitamins and keeps people more healthy that's a huge thing. And that's something that also a small co company can develop because it's not, it's not huge. It's, it's something you can do. Um, still, there's, there's a lot of things to, to look at. Uh, it has to be safe for environment and it has to be safe for com to consumers. But still, that's a market that's a lot more reachable also for smaller companies. And it also changes more within the community probably. It also, if you look at... Um, uh, development of like uh, genetically engineered yeasts. You can produce new drugs, you can produce food stuff, you can uh, produce a lot of things in, for example, yeast or bacteria. If you put genes in there that, that produce something, you can even think about biofuels or stuff like that. All of that is associated with CRISPR. So if you, if you manage this technique, it basically is hacking the code of life so you can you can build anything that any creature on earth can build within another creature and that uh, makes makes it very possible to produce things a lot more cheaply that than they are today and um, to also produce them in a very environmentally uh, friendly way because yeast for example just needs temperatures around 30 degrees and, and some sugar and it will produce whatever. And you don't need a huge cracking work or something and you don't need oil or anything. Uh, so it, it this, this whole bio-based economy has a lot of sites and not only pharmaceutical. And um, a lot of them are probably even more interesting and in the long run, more uh, will change more about a community and about uh, an economy than the medical sector. That was uh, that was a brilliant answer, and I believe uh, to the different researchers in here, medical doctors, the and students, it will uh, provide insight for their future research and uh, their future aspirations. So we have a question from Daniel Bamba. Um, it, it goes, hello, I am sorry, but I can't put on my mic. My question is, do you think that nowadays we can easily dissociate gene therapy and immunotherapy? Uh, that's, as I said, that's still quite complicated. Um, the, the way to a patient's bed is always a long way. And, and it has good reasons that it is, because you have to, uh, prove that that it is safe and you have to prove that it works and uh, that it doesn't have any any side effects that you don't want and especially for gene therapies that will probably be like that for the next 10 years at least until the first gene therapies are on the market a while and people see that it's safe and and all the ethical discussion about it cools down a bit so um that is probably something it's now coming but it's all coming from the big, big companies so we we in the next five years we will have a few hundred uh, different gene therapies on the market but none of them will come from a small company okay thank you i will believe um 
uh, that that's a satisfying answer for Danielle. And uh, we are plugging and coming to, to oh, there's a question. We've got another can question. Chris, can CRISPR cas help in aging research? Yes, definitely. I'm using it. Um, so also in very different ways. Um, there are there is research um, with with aging therapies directly, which are um, gene therapies, obviously not in humans, but uh, in mice, for example, there are experiments to to inject some um, some proteins that can, for example, uh, make telomeres longer. And in mice, that works quite well, depending on a study that uh, prolongs their life by a quarter or even 40%. Um, and it makes them more healthy and, and more fit in the last quarter of their life. Um, so there might be gene therapies coming up to, um, to help against aging. But the way I'm using it is actually, again, in yeast um, to, to modify a yeast to show me their the, the length of their telomeres. So what I'm doing is um, I'm I'm in the genome of the yeast, I'm making a cut and I force them to build in a new protein. And then what, what I'm doing is I'm tagging proteins that are in the yeast. So I've, I'm putting proteins that light up, for example, in a certain position. And by reading that light later on, I can say how long their, their telomeres are. And that's how I can use them for drug screening, for example. But basically any, any molecular uh, biology research that is carried out today uses CRISPR. So no matter what you are researching when you are working in, in molecular biology, you don't get, really get around CRISPR-Cas anymore. So far, no more questions, uh, Mr. Felix. Uh, it has been a huge pleasure for the NGO to have you with us tonight. And uh, we want to thank you for the, for this time you provided um, um, telling us the, the, the insights and the, 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 they've given a, a, like a, a real overview on uh, CRISPR cas So um, we hope that uh, Subsequently, in the future, we will have more uh, sessions like this. And uh, we thank all the participants, those part of the association and those who actually subscribed uh, the association is open. You would like to join. We are uh, a group of uh, medical technologies, medical doctor, nurses, communication specialists that uh, work um, for the promotion of STEM education and STEM careers with uh, a little bit of emphasis on natural sciences. And uh, we promote health and uh, we promote the protection of the environment and uh, research. Thank you, Mr. Felix Richard. I believe we are at the end of our webinar. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was a pleasure of being here. Yeah, and uh, really, well, thanks for your interest. And um, I, I really hope, uh, wish you all the best with uh, your further professional development. And I think CRISPR is really a topic that, that is, will be hot for the next 20 years, probably, and, and is already kind of the standard in uh, this molecular biology. Okay. So, um... Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, have a nice evening. Have a nice evening. Bye.